introduced in this workshop today, the racial uh, wealth gap. This is in celebration of Catholic Sisters Week. We are being challenged to raise awareness about ending hunger in Orange County. And we thought that we would bring this workshop for all of us um, to understand more about what is the link between racial inequality and food insecurity. We have with us David Giz, who is our um, Western um, representative for Bread for the World. He has prepared this presentation that will give us more information, uh, make us aware of some of the ways that we are able to take action. And I, I definitely um, tell you that you will learn lots today. So thank you for joining us. We will be here for about 90 minutes. We have sent you an email that has the letter that you will be um, writing, um, which if you just have handy, you don't need to uh, print it or anything, just have it handy. You, you can um, write your letters at the end of this workshop. That's just for your information. So I, it is my privilege to now introduce David Gist, our presenter for today. Thank you for joining us, David. Thank you for having me. It's good to be here with the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange. Um, always good ministry going on here and uh, appreciate uh, being a part of it. Um, well, good afternoon to everyone who is, is uh, listening in or is hearing a recording later. Uh, welcome to the Racial Wealth Gap Learning Simulation. This is an exercise that we're gonna take together to explore how a racial wealth gap, because that's an interesting phrase, has developed in this country. And I wanna be clear, the exercise is not about assigning blame to anyone or creating feelings of guilt for anyone. It's not even about discerning motives or intentions. Rather, this exercise we're gonna do examines outcomes, actual results, and outcomes are our focus today. So let me see if I can move us on to the next slide. Because Bread for the World is preoccupied with ending hunger and helping people lift themselves out of poverty and hardship, it's a pretty natural starting point for this exercise for us to take a quick look at hunger and poverty in this country. As you can see, hunger and poverty are pre-existing conditions for some people in this country. And pre-existing conditions is a phrase that we're using more and more in the time of COVID, but also in this time of uh, looking at public health. As these numbers indicate, hunger and poverty are pre-existing conditions for too many people, and in too many cases, people of color. In the US, people of color are twice as likely to experience hunger and live below the poverty line and be one paycheck away from being poor. Now during the pandemic, black, Latino and indigenous households have become at least three times as likely to experience these realities compared to their white counterpoints. And that prompts us to ask why. Why is there such a difference between racial groups around hunger and poverty? The racial wealth gap goes a long way to answering that question, why? Regardless of our background, we come to this exercise with questions about race, about injustice, about disparity, and about the conversations taking places in our houses of worship, on our campuses, in our communities, and on our streets. So let's look at these questions. Why should there be a gap between a wealth of different race groups in the US? What would create such a gap? And here's a topic one hears about in the news, financial reparations. When people discuss financial reparations based on slavery or race history, what are they talking about? And how might one identify and quantify damage? And this third question is a little bit loaded, but this third question is key, I think, to appreciating this exercise. And that's, is the system broken or is it working exactly as it was designed? It's so common that we hear people talk about the immigration system is broken or the criminal justice system is broken or the, the such and such, you fill in the gap, the system is broken. But is it truly broken 
or is it working as it was designed? Let's look at the graphic on the screen. The row of cyclists under equality, if you look at the graphic on the left side of the screen, the row of cyclists under equality reflects what happens when society provides equal resources to people regardless of need. The differently able person can't use the bike. The tall person is oversized for the bike. The child is too short for the bike. The row of cyclists under equity in the lower part of that graphic reflects what happens when society values outcomes and accordingly provides bikes appropriate for each user. The outcome reflects equity. I wanna introduce you to the Racial Wealth Gap's principal designer, Marcy, Marlisa Gamblin of Bread for the World's Institute. That's her photo up in the right-hand corner. And she, Marlisa collaborated with some friends at the Catholic Group Network to create the Racial Wealth Gap Learning Simulation. Now, there's some things that are helpful to know about Marlisa. First of all, she's extremely thorough. She's an exhaustive researcher and a brilliant academic with an advanced degree from Harvard. And I'm saying this not because I want to impress you, but I want to assure you that there's plenty of research behind the details of this exercise. They are definitely not random details. And you can visit Bread's website at www.bread.org and find our racial wealth gap and read more about it. Now, another thing to share about Marlisa is like myself, Marlisa is a native Californian and she cherishes the rich racial diversity we have in California of first people nations, immigrant communities, of people of many, many races forming this tapestry in California. But in this case, Marlisa designed this particular exercise to examine the racial wealth gap between two specific groups, African-Americans and Caucasian-Americans, but we'll often say Black Americans and White Americans in this exercise. It's an illustration of one specific racial wealth gap. Obviously, there are complicated histories for different people throughout the US, but please keep in mind this is a focused study of one particular racial wealth gap. Now, for the purposes of this exercise, we need to do two things right now. First, we need to assign ourselves roles. Some of us should, because this is interactive, some of us should take the role of a black participant and some of us should take the role of a white participant. If we were doing this in person, um, gathered around tables, we could distribute race participant cards, little cards that would have an identity on them for you to adopt for the purposes of the exercise. But we're, we're doing this virtually, so I invite you to choose a race participant role now. So choose either black participant or white participant now and maintain that role for the rest of the exercise. I think uh, Maria Elena has already arranged and invited a few people to be readers. So we've got that set up. And partly that's so that you don't have to hear my voice, voice the whole time. And I'll just say, you're welcome. That's right. Um, So now we're about ready to begin. Let me just say one last bit before we begin the exercise in earnest. Over the course of this exercise or simulation, we're going to examine 13 moments in US history, 13 policies, and the consequences of those policies will prompt us in our roles as black participants and white participants to draw money cards or land cards. Here, I'll hold, I'll hold something up there for the screen. Here's a little money card. If we were doing this in person, there's a money card or a land card or a opportunity loss card. Now, it almost makes it seem like it's a board game, like Monopoly, right? But I wanna call this an exercise rather than a game. Many game enthusiasts enjoy strategy games, but there's no strategy to this exercise. Rather, the exercise's power is in the journey itself and what we learn and what we take away and hopefully what we're inspired to do in response. So it's not a game, it's more of a reckoning. Now, final instruction. In the course of this exercise, following the first policies and then again after the next four policies, we're just gonna pause for a moment and, and have a chance to, to talk and answer and ask questions. If we, were, if we were doing this in another format, we might even break into Zoom breakout rooms, but we don't need to do that today. 
but it will give us a chance to process along the way. And I think that could be helpful. Now, if you want, you can keep score from your room or home by writing down which cards you've accumulated each turn. But if you don't wanna do that, I wanna let you know that we're gonna be keeping scored on a scorecard that you'll see on the screen after each policy point. So we will keep track for you. Okay, so by now, everyone should have chosen a role for themselves as either a white participant or a black participant. So let's go ahead and begin the exercise. So we're at our first policy and the first couple of policies come right after the Civil War and after Reconstruction. So it was a time of national trauma and a lot of turmoil. Do we have uh, uh, any readers who are lined up to read our first policy for us? It looks like Louise is raising a hand. Well, if you would unmute, unmute. okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's Andrew's, Andrew I, Dunn. I'm not, I'm not able to hear you. Are others able to hear? Okay, sorry, please continue. Am I okay? Okay, <laughs> right. Um, Andrew Johnson's land policies and sharecropping. After the Civil War, only 30,000 African Americans owned small plots of land compared to 4 million who did not because an 18, uh, sorry, 1865 federal law rescinded the government's promise of 40 acres of land for former slaves. These 4 million black people largely resorted to renting the farmland of their previous master in exchange for a share of their crop. This system of sharecropping tied farmers to their former master because they were legally obligated to buy all farming materials usually at higher prices, and sell their farming crops solely to the former master, usually at lower prices. Thank you, Louise. Oops, I'm sorry, we've got a little problem here. Just bear with me a moment. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and read the consequences of the policy. And uh, since I'm not able to hear you as you read, I guess I'll just have uh, Maria Elena cue me to say when you're done reading each card. Um, but in this case, those of you who have chosen to be in the role of Black participants, you would at this point pick up one land card and one money card to represent the less than 1% of African Americans who were able to own land and not face debt after slavery. Unfortunately, black participants should also pick up four lost opportunity cards for the 4 million African Americans who had to share crop and were denied the initial promise of land ownership. Buying farm supplies from the landowner at higher prices only to sell their crops back at lower prices resulted in African Americans facing higher levels of debt and higher rates of hunger. And here is what I refer to as the scorecard or the reckoning card. We can see where we are now. So black participants have accumulated a little bit of money, a little bit of land and four opportunity lost cards. Let's move on to the second policy. And if someone, Louise, would you like to read that one as well? Sure. Policy two is land seizures. From 1865 on, black people could have had their land seized to pay sharecropping debts or simply because white landowners declared that black farmers or businesses were in debt. Black people could not fight these charges because they were legally prohibited from suing white people in court. In addition, from 1949 to 1970, one million lost their land to abuses of the power of eminent domain, 
which allows local governments to seize private property. About 70% of these families were African American. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Louise. Yeah. Now, the dynamics between many white Americans and black Americans were obviously volatile following the, uh, the end of slavery and, and it shouldn't come as a surprise that former slave owners influenced government and policy in ways that exploited black Americans, but it's still very, very discouraging. So with this second policy, land seizures, those in the role of white participants in this exercise, you would pick up one land card and two money cards for having the legal ability to seize the land of black farmers and business owners, increasing your income and reducing your vulnerability to hunger. Those in the role of black participants would return a land card for the land lost under land seizures. Also return a money card for the tens of millions of dollars lost mm -hmm. from no longer having land mm -hmm. to help earn an income and grow food to eat. Mm -hmm. And so this is now the new wow. reckoning or scorecard after two policies. Wow. Do we have someone who would be so kind as to read uh, policies three and four for us? Yeah, I will. Sister Kathleen, yeah. great, thank you. Okay, the National Housing Act of 1934, part one. Policies under this law guaranteed federally backed loans to white people and legally refused loans to black people and anyone else who chose to live in or near black neighborhoods. This practice known as re redlining targeted entire black neighborhoods and identified them as grade D. This made it nearly impossible for appraisers in the private sector to do business in black neighborhoods because all the residents were considered bad credit risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. So now white participants pick up one land card and one money card for the equity gained in purchasing homes not near black neighborhoods. Equity increased a family's ability to save for future needs. Black participants do not pick up any land cards because of the inability to purchase homes do not pick up any money cards since it was illegal to lend to black people, preventing them from building equity and weakening their ability, whoop, excuse me, weakening their ability mm -hmm. for future needs. And this is our scorecard after three policies. So as you see that the money and land cards are beginning to develop for those in the role of white participants. Now, I've got this posted here because redlining is a very interesting uh, tradition and a very unfortunate tradition, mm. but a lot of articles can tell us how not only it took place a century ago and then early in the 20th century, but how it's going on today. And so I can, I can, uh, I don't think I can put these links into the chat room, but I don't know if someone else is able to do that if there's a chat room and uh, maybe Maria Elena can, can copy the links and put them in the chat room for you. But then you could simply copy the link from the chat room and go and read that if you have any follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. And I, I'll just let you know, there are three spots in this exercise where I've got a few links like this, just for, for um, more information to read about and consider these kinds of issues. Uh, I've chosen these three because that's where I've got most questions over the course of time doing this exercise. And so it's, it's helpful to have a little background information. Um, okay, I'll go on to, to policy four. Is someone, would someone be so kind as to read policy four for us? I'll go ahead. I can go ahead with it. Oh, okay. Okay. The National Housing Act of 1934, Part 2. Since this legislation prevented Black people from receiving federally backed home mortgages, white people usually purchased homes in Black neighborhoods and then sold housing contracts to Black households who wanted to become homeowners. 
often for two or three times the amount of the mortgage. These contracts only guaranteed black families the rights to the house after all the payments were complete. Missing even one payment or being late would result in the black family losing their house immediately. Wow, that last line is so crucial. Missing even one payment or being late would result in the black family losing their house immediately. immediately. That is that is so strict and, and you can imagine how easily that could take place and how often that did take place. You know, the first couple of policies were following the Civil War, a nation's great trauma, but the Great Depression was also another trauma for the world and, and then for certainly for the U.S. And it's, it's troublesome that so many of these policies we're examining, these last two and then the next couple, were part of the New Deal as, yeah. as FDR and the nation tried to rebuild following the Great Depression. And the New Deal is often lifted up, even heralded as a set of laws and policies and an infusion of jobs that helped our nation. But as we see, mm -hmm. too many African-Americans and too many people of color were left out of the New Deal. So the, the consequence for policy four, mm. those in the role of black participants, please pick up one land card for signing a contract for a home in hopes of becoming a landowner one day, but do not pick up any money cards because contracts stripped additional income and wealth from several generations. Also pick up one lost opportunity card because of the higher interest rate paid and less equity earned once that home was actually purchased. Now those in the role of white participants pick up two land cards for being able to legally purchase homes at the market rate and pick up two money cards for the equity earned from home ownership. And of course, home equity is such a huge part of, of family historic wealth passed from generation to generation. So you can see already how this would create a wealth gap. And so here for black participants, the opportunity loss cards are growing um, but uh, money and land cards are going for white participants. So sometimes at this point, we, we go into breakout rooms, but we don't need to do that today. Instead, I could just invite some, some uh, commentary. For those of you participating, what did you learn that you didn't know before so far? And how do you feel about your race participants role? Would anyone like to share? I will. <clears throat> I was going to say I didn't know anything about all these uh, land grants or taking over the, their land and so on. I'm just totally uh, not taught in history classes at all. And uh, of course, I, I taught American history. I was more junior high level, but there were so many things probably I didn't know in the '60s about the New Deal and FDR. I was a big advocate of FDR, thought he was the greatest president uh, and kind of in, imbued that into my students. You know, at last we have someone who's taking care of the nation, <laughs> but the nation wasn't really um, equitable. Now I don't have to say equal, say equitable because uh, it certainly left a lot of people. I always just thought it was just poor people. I just labeled things as poor. I didn't really label them as necessarily white or black, but sounds like this, that really this color of the skin was important in the new deal of which I was not aware of. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well, why don't we... Mary, go ahead. Um, yeah. I remember studying for some reason when I was in the um, poverty and minorities concentration of social work in Sacramento. And we were discussing redlining. And it was interesting because at the time, my dad was telling me in the GI Bill he was able to get the GI Bill as a veteran for um, when he moved to Costa Mesa. But there was a provision in the GI Bill that did not 
did it, it excluded African Americans, and I had not known that. And that was at the time right after the war. Yeah. And you won't be surprised, uh, Mary, to hear that, that uh, the GI Bill is going to be part of this exercise. We're coming to it still, but you're absolutely right. It's, you know, that's, that's one of the, the build, landmark bills of the 20th century that you think was, was ultimately designed to lift everyone up and to really help those who had put uh, their lives on the line and their families who had sacrificed for them to be able to do that. And then to see that it didn't play out that way is, is, is very disappointing. So my other part of the question- Any other is, thoughts or comments uh, before we move to the next exercise? Go ahead, Mary. Go ahead. I just, yeah. I just have a question to ponder. So when white flight took, took part in Southgate and in Compton and in Watts, and people were moving out to, let's say, safer neighborhoods. The African American community was not able economically to have any kind of equity to move out because of jobs. Am I am I connecting this correctly? I think you are. I think you are. I, I don't want to. I don't want to point to necessarily only one thing that was uh, keeping people uh, in one neighborhood and rather than allowing them to be uh, able to move on, but, but certainly the lack of equity in home equity and other kinds of equity that are passed down from generation to generation would keep people in the lowest income uh, that they could find and, and the, the lowest real estate that was available. And then of course, as, as we, we've mentioned with redlining, but we'll get to it in another um, in another section. And I feel we're getting a little bit ahead of the exercise. Okay. So if we the exercise will unfold some more of these things. But but um, certainly people were were uh, have been kept in 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 place in a sense by by realtors and the real estate market and banking and how that has managed things for people. Um, but we'll, we'll some prime, subprime loans is another one. But again, we're gonna that's still coming in the exercise. Okay, thank you. So, well, it's, if it's all right with maybe we can move on to the next uh, policy. Mm -hmm. Is that good with everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go ahead and and um, if if someone would be so kind as to read policies five and six, um, you can go forward. All right, I will. The Social Security Act of 1935. Do you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. This act failed to include most farm workers and domestic workers who at this time were predominantly black from receiving old age and unemployment insurance. Although Social Security was meant to help those affected by the Great Depression and African Americans were twice as likely as the average American family to face hunger during this time, 65% of African Americans were ineligible to receive social security. Hmm. Yeah. The consequence of the Social Security Act of 1935, white participants pick up one money card for being able to benefit from unemployment and old age insurance during a very grim time in American history. And black participants would pick up one lost opportunity card for the inability to benefit from unemployment insurance, even though African Americans were between two and three times as likely as white Americans to experience poverty and hunger. And here is our scorecard after five policies. And here's okay. policy number could you, six. Could, David, could you, uh, can I ask a question? Oh, but, sure. Yeah. Uh, just uh, the fact that why couldn't they be eligible? What was the underlying reason for not being eligible? Maybe I missed that. I think a lot of things were, a lot of bills that were written were then carried out 
um, locally and locally people were able to influence who had access to them. So, and several, that's been the answer for several of these uh, policies is that certain groups were not given access to them. So I may, I may have to, I may have to find a, a, an article and send it to you as background because I don't have an article for that particular question. So sorry, I don't have more details, but, but most of this has had to do with simply with access and, and limiting access. Mm -hmm. But if a bill had been written in a way, if the bill writers and, and legislators who anticipate racist possibilities in terms of how a bill is being enacted and carried out, then they could write it in such a way that they could guarantee access for people of all backgrounds and races. But they did not do that. They put it out there and whether there was racist intent on the part of the legislators or racist intent on those who were carrying it out or whether there was not even intent but simply something took place uh, in terms of uh, looking at incomes or looking at groups who are, who are qualifying and it simply carried out that way, the outcome is, is what we talked about. So I apologize that I'm not able to, to answer every intention question, but that's why we say we're talking about looking at outcomes because sometimes people have good intentions and sometimes they have bad intentions, but these policy consequences reflect the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Now let's see if I can... Uh, I'm having trouble with my okay. cursor. Oh, good. That worked. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's where we are after five policies. Mm -hmm. Number six, the Fair Labor Standards of 1938 created minimum wage and time and a half overtime pay and prohibits oppressive child labor. This law was enacted to help bolster the economy and get the country out of the Great Depression, but it excluded tip-based jobs and other jobs predominantly held by black workers, including servers, shoe shiners, domestic workers, and Pullman porters from this first ever minimum wage legislation. Even though the black unemployment, hunger and poverty rates were at least twice those of white people during the Great Depression, the very policies meant to alleviate economic strain were withheld from the Black community. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which, which again, it created minimum wage. It's a huge, huge act and time and a half overtime, overtime pay and prohibiting oppressive child labor. Those are three important steps, but even so, for people in the role of black participants who pick up one lost opportunity card for being stuck in these tip-based occupations that didn't offer a minimum wage and that didn't help families survive during the Great Depression. This made it even harder for these families to get back on their feet and build for the future. Those in the role of white participants pick up one money card for benefiting from the minimum wage, which is getting talked about even today, to make their families less vulnerable to hunger and poverty. And here the scorecard is now really getting pronounced after six policies. We're about halfway through that exercise. And you can see the opportunity loss cards are really piling up for black participants and the money and land piling up for white participants. Would someone be so kind as to read the seven and eight, the policies for us? Okay, I'll go ahead with the next ones. The GI Bill of 1944. This was enacted to help World War II veterans adjust to civilian life by providing low cost home mortgages, low interest business loans, tuition assistance, and unemployment insurance. Unfortunately, black veterans were excluded from many of these benefits due to various access problems and local implementation among other factors. Thank you. It's getting clearer now. <laughs> well, as a result of the GI Bill, white participants would pick up two money cards and one land card for the opportunities to receive, such as government guaranteed housing loans, which helped to build the American middle class, quote unquote. Black participants in your group, and, and I, let me 
explain this part. Usually when one does this in person at a table, we might have tables broken into eight people at a table. And so you might have four people at the table in the role of black participant, four people in the role of white participant. And of that group of four, where only one black participant picks up a money card. So that would be about 25% of African-Americans would pick up a money card representing the few African-Americans who had access to some benefits of the GI Bill. All black participants pick up one lost opportunity card for not being able to benefit from the GI Bill, even though they too had fought for their country in World War II. Um, as you see, the, the, the numbers are getting more pronounced. And here, I've in included a couple of links because we usually get questions and I don't know if Maria Elena can uh, put those links in the chat room so that you can copy that link and uh, put it in your browser and see if you want to read that article. But, but this, is, this is a big one because the GI, as we mentioned earlier, the GI Bill was so fundamental for so many people uh, building their lives um, after, after the wars and that it ultimately did leave out too many African Americans is, is tragic. So I think many of us have can point to family members who have benefited from the GI Bill and how that has influenced our own family history. So I encourage you to, to, to look at these links. Um, wow. Should I move on? Is that the name? Okay. All righty. And here we are at uh, policy number eight. Would uh, someone read yeah. that mm -hmm. for us? Okay, I'll continue here. Overturn of separate but equal doctrine, which upheld legal racial segregation. Although the separate but equal doctrine was declared unconstitutional in 1954, Brown versus Brown Board of, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, American schools are more racially segregated today than in any other time in the past four decades. Academic success is less likely in predominantly low income black neighborhoods. Black students are five times as likely to live in an area of concentrated poverty with unfunded, under, understaffed and overcrowded schools. This leaves black students with limited education and many often settle for minimum wage jobs that offer little hope of advancement or better pay. Thank you. Yeah. Following policy number eight, white participants would pick up two more money cards for having up to $733 higher annual per student spending on education than black students. This contributes to a greater likelihood of attending college and later getting a high paying job. Those in the role of black participants would pick up only one money card to represent the 75% high school graduation rate among black students compared to 88% among white students. Also pick up one lost opportunity card for the lower student spending that helps funnel many black students into low wage work after high school. And this is a scorecard after eight or a little more than halfway through the exercise. And it's getting very, very pronounced. We won't have breakout rooms, but let me just pause again to see if there's anything new here that people are hearing and, and what that prompts for you in terms of what you think, gosh, how do, how do we address that? How can we address outcomes and racial equity where there's been inequity? Well, I still go back to this um, intentional, was this exclusion intentional or what? I guess that's my basic question that keeps going through every one of these things that, that we read. Sure. Uh, how intentional was that? And of course, with looking at government, uh, who are the people representing government were the ones that were gonna be profiting from all of this. Right. Um, it, it's an understandable question, and I apologize if I if I sound like a politician dodging the question. Um, you know, I intentionally focused on outcomes uh, rather than intentions because uh, 
I've talked with Marlisa about this a number of times. I had, I share your question. You know, what, what's going on? How were, how were people this diabolical? Were they this just yeah. uninformed? Was yeah. it just a greater aura of racism that drove everything at this time? And there are elements of all of those, but, but ultimately there've been books written about about the subject and Marlisa has, has read them and studied them and, and have implemented them into her, her thinking, incorporated them into her thinking. And, and ultimately she just has, has encouraged us to set aside intention. So I, I apologize, that's not the answer you're looking for, but, yeah. but because there are so many different intentions at different levels of people who, who wrote, wrote the bill, people who uh, were administrators nationally, who were administrators at state levels, because a lot of these policies mm -hmm. were carried out at the state level. And, and so it's, it's just hard to, it's hard to say, as, ascribe one intention mm -hmm. to explain everything, because mm -hmm. I think there's so many different people with different motives. Um, and so intentions yeah. are really difficult to measure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. David, um, I don't understand if they would um, have the money to go to make a really good school in a black neighborhood or a brown neighborhood rather than having it depend upon the local city or whatever, wherever the money comes from. And that way you distribute the monies to every school and not depend upon who comes to the school. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? Mary, go ahead, Mary. Yeah, Maybe I was he can't following you. up with Kathleen's sister. Are you Sister Kathleen? No, I'm Sister Kathleen up here. Okay, Sister Kathleen. I love the sisters. Um, it re reminds me too also of property tax and schools. Education is one of the most predominant ways that could improve equity amongst groups. But it still seems like the property tax is the most unequal ways. I'm not trying to say this um, efficient, effectively, but it seems like the property tax still affects monies and resources that go to schools. But somehow there have to be an equal amount of money put into every school, no matter who comes to that school. It should be the best education with the best teachers and so on. Right, right. Thank you. <laughs> Something's wrong there. Indeed. I often, I'm often thinking too, uh, as you're talking and reading these uh, different uh, paragraphs, the monumental work that women did during that time with all the opposition that they would have, uh, the women's right to vote, but that didn't include black women. Is that true? I think that was originally true at that time. So black women could vote in 1920 or when it, when it was passed or was it until the Voting Rights Act when uh, blacks could also uh, vote? I think it was later. It was later. Okay, but still I think it's monumental. The women that could get voting, not being excluded, I guess <laughs> that was the word. And also, uh, I, th I think that it's uh, monumental how people got into public office that were black during those, you know, I've been reading about black history last month and all these different people that made great advances and how, you know, and I'm thinking, oh yeah, they got, they got elected, good, they got elected. But if I can consider that this is a, a period of great exclusion of black people for benefits and for anything, even to get voted in, Right. to me was monumental and I praise them for that. <laughs> that's, that's a very good point. I mean, we didn't talk about it at the time, but back in those first two policies that we looked at, 
during Reconstruction and right after the Civil War and the emancipation of, of slaves, um, quite a few of Black Americans got were elected to office, but it was a short-lived phenomenon mm -hmm. as, as mm -hmm. basically former slaveholders uh, mm -hmm. took steps to make it more difficult to, to vote. I mean, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit in, the, in another policy still coming about Thank voting, but, but basically that's been a problem from the beginning. So there was a, a, a brief surge of, of more black people in public office shortly after the Civil War. And then as, as reactionaries responded to that and changed laws and, and, and changed policies and simply threatened and bullied and made it unsafe to do that, uh, the numbers dwindled back down. Okay. Yeah. Well, why don't we why don't we go on to the next uh, next policy? Oh, good. And my screen screen is cooperating. Pleased to say that. So um, here we are at uh, policy number nine: subprime loans, and that's a that's a term that's that's used today. So I think some of the things we've been talking about, like the GI Bill following the war. Um, are, are things we look at as a part of history, but some private loans feel a little bit more contemporary for us. Um, would anyone be so kind as to read the numbers nine and 10 for us? Okay, I will. <laughs> Number nine. Starting in the 1970s and continuing today, the private sector issued subprime loans, which are loans with higher interest rates, to black families almost exclusively, regardless of a family's income, education, or good credit history. As a result, black people continue to unfairly pay more for homes of the same value as their white counterparts. This increases foreclosure rates among black households, mm. which also contributes to higher food insecurity levels. Now, I'm, I'm white and a homeowner, and I have not experienced this reality, but my, my dear colleague Florence, who is the organizer for Bread for Low in Florida, is African American and has experienced subprime loans, and in fact at one point lost her house as a result of that and can testify to that powerfully, mm -hmm. that it's really an, an insidious uh, a practice, I believe. Um, the consequence of subprime loans for white Participants, they'd pick up two land cards and two money cards, <laughs> securing good interest rates on homes. That's what you want. But the idea is to encourage home ownership and, and home equity and growth. But in this case, Black participants, Black homeowners were forced into subprime mortgages as their only option for more than three generations. But that ended up stripping income and wealth from the Black community, as you can imagine. High income black households were 80% more likely to lose their homes than high income white households when the housing bubble burst in 2008. And that's exactly what caught Florence. And 240,000 black people lost their homes. Mm. Therefore, black participants in this exercise would pick up only one land card and one money card so, uh, as a result mm. of subprime loans. And here again, we've got a, a couple of links. Uh, so maybe uh, Maria Elena can put that in a chat room if someone wants to read a little bit more about that. The second link where it says loss of wealth in a black majority county, that actually takes its place in Maryland, which is of course adjacent to Washington, DC. And that's a, a black majority county. And yet, and, and, and you would think by proximity might have some attention in, in the, the seat of power in Washington, DC, and yet, subprime loans have created a real black wealth loss there. So these are pretty interesting articles that I commend to you. Uh, I'll go on to, um, I think we're at uh, number 10, is it? Yes, mm -hmm. policy 10, the war on drugs. Okay, I'll do that one. Thank you. The war, on, the war on Drugs, initiated in 1971 and continuing today, widened the racial wealth gap with policies targeting Black and Brown communities. Although rates of using and selling drugs are compar comparable across racial lines, Black people are up to 10 times as likely to be stopped, searched, arrested, prosecuted, convicted 
and or incarcerated for drug violations as white people. Since this means that black families are up to 10 times as likely to have a family member sent to prison. They are, then, they are more than 10 times likely to fall into hunger because of incarceration. I think uh, some of you have written letters in the past few years with us mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to our elected leaders around incarceration and really around that intersection between hunger, racial equity, and mass incarceration because so many people of color, too many people of color are incarcerated and, and disproportionately so. The result, the consequence of policy 10 for black participants combined debt and property depreciation, increased hunger and poverty rates within the black community. So participants would return two money cards for being more likely to be incarcerated than white people and owing debts of about $13,000 per household in fees and court costs when a family member is incarcerated. Return one land card for the estimated $11 billion in lower property values in many African-American communities caused by the return of large numbers of people from jail or prison. And it's something we don't talk about as often, but the, the, the impact upon property value and how that also drives that racial wealth gap. White participants return two money cards for the more than $180 billion in tax dollars that it costs to maintain mass incarceration today. And I'll just pause right there. This is the first point in the exercise where white participants are actually losing money. So mass incarceration in our criminal justice system is actually costing everyone, not just one race group or another, but it's really costing the nation as a whole. So also white participants pick up one lost opportunity card since these taxpayer dollars could instead be used to support programs that end hunger and poverty in the United States. Of course, they could be used to support any number of programs that invest in communities but we mentioned end, end hunger and poverty because that is our mission of Bread for the World. And here is our standings after 10 policies. We're on the home stretch, just a couple more policies to look at. But as you see, the, the scorecard is very, very heavily weighted. Here's policy 11. Would okay. someone be surprised? <clears throat> Thank you. All right, I'll do it. Life after incarceration, consequences of the war on drugs. When people are released from jail or prison, they are hoping for a second chance, but they face more than 48,000 separate restrictions that deny rights and opportunities to people who have paid their debt to society. Examples of lifelong penalties include being denied the right to vote in some states, being prohibited from applying to higher paying jobs, being ineligible to receive federal food assistance, and being banned from getting a barber's license. <laughs> as black people are up to 10 times as likely as white people to be stopped, arrested and sentenced, they are also up to 10 times as likely to face these restrictions. <clears throat> it doesn't say it explicitly here. Of course, we also know that people of color are, are sentenced to greater lengths in prison than our white people in this country for the same crimes and the same uh, arrests. So there's another area of inequity. Um, California, I think most of you on the call, unless someone's calling in from rather far away, but uh, California is less restrictive than a lot of states. Um, in Florida, it's getting more and more known nationally as that's been quite a story that people uh, upon release from prison uh, are in, in many cases denied the right to vote. And I, I'm not sure about the, the thinking behind that or the justification for that. When again, you think about paying your debt to society, if one has paid one's debt and is re-entering society, isn't, doesn't, you know, certainly responsibilities come with that, but one of those responsibilities is voting. And, and so of course, uh, the, actually, the husband of one of my fellow organizers for a few years at Bread for the World, Desmond Mead, was part of a movement in Florida that helped overturn that and restore voting rights for, for formerly incarcerated people. Um, and then in a reactionary response to that, then uh, 
courts and, and legislatures are making it more difficult uh, for people to do that because they're imposing fees and, and fines on them and all kinds of things. So then groups are now forming to try to raise money to help pay those fees because it's just, it's just one more way to prevent people from voting. Um, and unfortunately, too much voter suppression has been very racially biased, trying to prevent people of color from voting. Um, I, I commend you an, an excellent documentary, I think, uh, available on Netflix. And, and perhaps someone remembers the name. It's, it's featuring Stacey Abrams. And, um, oh, forgive me, the, the name has just slipped out of my head. But it's, it's, an, it's a very good piece. And it documents, it's not necessarily a bio on her. It's really looking at voter rights in Georgia and some of the atrocities that have happened, but some of the steps that people have taken to try to restore voting rights. So the policy of this is, is really just for black participants in this exercise. There are five times as many black people as white people returning home with criminal records. So participants would pick up two lost opportunity cards to represent how black communities are more likely to fall into hunger because so many returnees are unable to reintegrate into society, get a job and or access federal and state food assistance. Mm. By the way, that's something that we're really, really pleased about in where I live in Pasadena and Altadena, that region, there is a, a, a council, the Pasadena Altadena uh, Reintegration, uh, Reentry uh, Council that, that gathers on a monthly basis, providing fairs and gatherings for people who are returning citizens, leaving uh, incarceration, and they have a lot of different social services that, that gather at these gatherings. They have um, job opportunities, trainers, uh, people who can come and train you in a job and actually help you get a license in that field. So a lot of very specific, uh, helpful things. But also interestingly, I've noted that law enforcement in Pasadena and Altadena is a part of that too. And law enforcement leaders there have made it very clear they want people leaving prison to succeed. And so there's a case where everyone is on the same page together. And that's what we need more of if we're going to affect real change is for people to recognize we need all to be on that same page together. Here's the scorecard after 11 policies. Mm -hmm. Would someone be so kind? I know I keep asking that. I apologize, but someone <laughs> could read policy 12 for us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I'll be glad to do it. Employment discrimination. Although racial discrimination in the workforce was legally abolished in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act, racial discrimination continues among all educational levels and job sectors. For example, black people are twice as likely not to be called back after they complete job applications or interviews. In addition, the gap between the hourly pay of black people and white people grew from 355 per hour in 1979 to 6.73 cents an hour in 2016. Thank you. Wow. So in the area of employment discrimination, in this exercise, black participants pick up two lost opportunity cards for being two times less likely to receive a job callback and for earning an average of $14,000 a year less than your white peers. Yeah. Doing the math shows that racial discrimination in the workforce costs black workers at least $600,000 over the course of their working years. White participants pick up two money cards for being twice as likely to receive a callback for a job and for earning an average of $14,000 a year more than your black peers. And here we have the, the scorecard after 12 of our 13 policies. I'll just go ahead and read this last one. Policy 13, voting restrictions. Voting is key to ending hunger and poverty. As early as 1890, black people faced organized campaigns to prevent them from voting, including biased literacy tests. And I, and I cannot emphasize enough how much the quote marks are needed for that literacy test. Literacy tests, poll taxes, and even lynching. I would say, and even murder. 
1965, the Voting Rights Act passed, making efforts to prevent voting illegal. But today, people returning from jail or prison, as we talked about earlier, who are disproportionately Black, are denied the right to vote in many states. In addition, as recently as 2017, states have proposed voter ID laws, which would require voters to have government-issued identification. It is more difficult for African Americans to obtain these. One in four face barriers compared with one in 10 white people. Barriers include, for example, having to pay up to $150 for an acceptable copy of a birth certificate and social security card, travel costs, and time taken off from work. As we know, for, for those who are working two or three part-time jobs to get by, um, taking time off from work is almost a non-starter. And when we mentioned, when this, this uh, policy mentions literacy tests, I want to be clear that that does not mean uh, literally what it sounds like, that you're showing that you're able to read. Um, some historians unearthed some of these literacy tests, and a law professor was gave these tests to his law students who could not pass them. So if law students are unable to pass a literacy test, I'm gonna speculate that it's pretty strict and pretty uh, difficult to pass. And these, were, these literacy tests were targeted at black voters. So as a consequence for this, black participants pick up one lost opportunity card for number one, being prevented from voting in the early 1900s and certainly in other periods as well, when the votes of black people might have prevented some of the harmful laws mentioned in this simulation from being enacted. And I think one of you made that exact point a few minutes ago. And number two, we're still facing voting restrictions that disproportionately impact black communities and weaken efforts to improve policies that end hunger and poverty. So this is an, this is an interesting slide here. It's, 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 it's a timeline, as you can see. And, it just uh, shows this timeline of these policies, which I just have to say are racist policies and woven through different key points in our history, following the Civil War, following the Great Depression, and then later as, uh, as uh, following the, the World War II, and then in more modern times, in the 60s and 70s and 80s uh, uh, with real estate and then looking uh, all the way up to today with what's happening with incarceration. And I'm, if anyone is particularly interested in having a copy of this, just this slide, I have emailed this to people upon request, just this slide separate from the PowerPoint, because it's an interesting one, you know, one image that uh, one can hold on to in reference. So I'm happy to do that. If yes. you get any rest, just let Maria Elena know, and I'm happy yeah. to Thank you. do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so afterwards you say, well, that, okay. Mm -hmm. So we, we went mm -hmm. through 13 different steps and how many money cards did everyone end up with? Well, the final standings, if you're doing this at, at home or in your room, um, mm -hmm. black participants should have their accumulated 14 opportunity loss cards and only two land cards and only one fourth of people participating as black participants would have some money whereas white participants would have accumulated 13 money cards and I'm trying to remember think about eight uh, land cards and one only one opportunity lost card. Now this, this 13, there's a 13 to one ratio here and in net wealth, and that, that's actually correct. In, in real US dollars, white households have a net worth of 13 times the net worth of black households. Now, I should be clear when I say that, that's not what every white family or every black family has. It's most likely few of any actual families have that ratio. This is what we call the quote unquote typical amount for the household that falls in the middle of the wealth spectrum. We're using this illustration to show the overall impact of federal policies that either enable different communities to build wealth or hinder or prevent them from doing so. And it also explains today's levels of food insecurities among communities of color. Now in this slide, we see that among the lowest earners, white households have a median net worth of $18,000, which is not much, while black families have a median net wealth of near zero. Among this group, we see that the wealth gap is actually larger, 18,000 to zero. 
a lot of what I think we're seeing here is the inheritance of wealth from generation to generation. Sometimes that's in the form of land or property like a house. The reason half the participants with a black racial identity card ended up with zero money cards, or actually three fourths of them, is to indicate the extreme wealth gap among the most financially vulnerable households in our country. And it shows how pervasive this impact of racial inequality has been, or inequity, has been when we see that it exists at all income levels. And that shows how important it is to apply a racial equity lens to our work in order to move forward. So thinking about this exercise, I hope, I hope it helps us understand why racial equity is important to us address structural inequality. And that if we import, incorporate a racial equity lens into our daily work and life and worship and policies, practices, advocacy, there's real value in that. And we've certainly experienced that at Bread for the World. In the last several years, we are increasingly applying a racial equity lens into understanding hunger and understanding how to respond to hunger. And we want to be equipped to advocate for applying for a racial equity lens when working to end hunger or poverty. You know, someone the other day reminded me that applying a racial equity lens is a, is a catchy phrase, but maybe it's not the right phrase because we can take lenses on and off. So maybe you want to say applying a racial equity framework so that we're not just taking that lens off too easily. Mm -hmm. Now, let me just say one, one final thing. And, th and this, I think, is, is really interesting for today. You know, those 13 policy points we looked at, those were starting from post-Civil War up until now. But what's happening in the era of COVID? Well, we know that in 2020, last year, when Congress responded to the pandemic and, 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 and put together its first pandemic package, there, were, there was a lot of money allocated to go to small businesses to try to help small businesses because that's a, that's a some would say that's the backbone of America. I don't know about that, but it's, it's certainly an important component of society, businesses. And yet after that, that assistance relief went out, it was pointed out to Congress that Congress had chosen largely banks and, and savings and loans and financial institutions that work mostly with white businesses, not necessarily with black businesses, with Latina, Latina businesses, with uh, Asian American businesses, with indigenous businesses, but white businesses. And so there is when it's a reminder that we need to insist that the Congress and the state legislatures are, are applying a racial equity lens or framework to their work. That they can't just think, oh, we'll just send money to this, this, these banks and it'll all work out. No, it won't. Because not all banks work with all people. And so we have to see the ties in society and be more thoughtful about that. So I think it's, it's really important to keep that in mind. And also we saw, uh, and it was widely, widely reported throughout 2020, that people of color were disproportionately affected by COVID. And that has a lot to do with public health and, and public finance and, and, and how, um, how people were, were cast in certain uh, financial strata. So, so there's a lot of things that, that COVID has shined a light on for us. Now, on the positive side of this, I'm amazed, these last two links here, I don't know, Maria Elena, if you're able to lift these two links and put them in the chat, but I'm amazed the Federal Reserve of all bodies in our government, the Federal Reserve has been making noises and expressing concern about racial equity. And they're starting to say, wait a minute, as, as, we, as we are the great overseers of this economy, we need to be thinking more about how people of color are affected. Uh, by various legislation and policies and economic terms. So I, I commend that article to you to take a look at. And then finally, the last article in there, it says under Anti-Racism and Public Health Act of 2021, it's in, in the red font. That is a very interesting bill that, that makes the connection between over-policing and discrimination on the part of law enforcement with public health. And it, and, it, and it recognizes that certain reforms need to come in this nation um, that affect public health. 
So anyway, I just offer that as another interesting look at how our elected leaders might be more thoughtful in the future about uh, racial inequity and racial equity and achieving racial equity. Well, just in the, in the final couple of minutes that we have, I just wonder if, if you all want to continue talking. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have an answer for every question, but just wondering how you see these kinds of racial wealth and income divides playing out in your communities. And, and certainly the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, where you have such a network and reach out and connect with so many people in Southern California and throughout the world, but it's so many people, um, how does this impact your work? And, and how are you, can you incorporate a racial equity lens into your daily work? Well, I know you already do that, but, but how can this be a part of the conversation and other things moving forward? Those are a little bit broad questions, but does anyone have any thoughts on, the, on that? Oops. You know, during this COVID time, uh, we've had probably uh, less uh, opportunity for some hands-on work and um, uh, talking with people um, in general. We know uh, specific people that we've kept in contact with, but to be able to go to a meeting and discuss with people of varied varieties and uh, backgrounds, not necessarily, you know, just on Zoom, that we're so restricted to interacting. For me, uh, and with Orange County having maybe a less Black population than, uh, and even Orange, um, than another, other parts, I would find myself saying, I really don't know, because I haven't had my hands on for the about maybe the last year of people um, I've, I've had phone calls about people, uh, but we're so, uh, we just, I guess the only thing we can do is that we can feed the hungry, but I don't know how much we can really, uh, at this point, um, help some of this inequality. Uh, I feel uh, a little bit helpless sometimes on this. Sorry. It's... Yeah, it's it's it's. You were big, always blaming it on COVID, but it is. <laughs> you know? I couldn't hear that last part. I'm just saying we always seem to blame things on COVID, but that's the way it is when we can't interact normally with people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, I know it's there. Yeah. But you're you're right. I mean, COVID has been very limiting, right? If it's keeping us in our homes and and preventing us. From, from interacting and, and connecting with other people, it, it, it is harder to be out there. I mean, I think we can, we can continue to read and listen and you know, whether we're, we're, we're following podcasts or listening to the news or reading the news and keeping up on, on what's going on. But, but you all have so many interesting programs here. I mean, you've, over the years you've studied films and read literature together and been out in the community and, and had the community come to you. And even if some of those things aren't as easy to do now in terms of people coming into the, the mother house, um, I, th I think that you're still in, in position where you can, uh, can speak out to elected leaders. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we've actually, one of the things we've been doing in Northern California in, in the Bay Area um, is letting, there's a congresswoman up there named Barbara Lee from Oakland and Berkeley, who's a very, very progressive leader mm -hmm. and is actually has some interesting positions as a certain chair of a committee. I won't get into that. But um, we've been letting her and her staff know about this racial wealth gap exercise because there are pastors up there and leaders up there who are carrying it out and doing a lot of public education around this issue. And she and, she and her staff are pleased about that because the more people are able to think about racial inequity and thinking about how history and policy drives this and how even today we need to remember to keep Congress on the straight and narrow when it comes to it, that works for her. And so she's, she may help us hold a larger event in the fall to get more people thinking about uh, race and food equity, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there, 
We also have a real opportunity this year because of our new senator. Um, now that uh, Kamala Harris is vice president and not a senator from California, we have Senator Alex Padilla from, from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And he, I think, is a good guy. And, and we're um, hoping to get his attention. We've already had one meeting with him. We're hoping to have a number of meetings with him. And, and we may be able to get him on, say, a big Zoom call with us in the late summer or fall and get his attention on some of these issues. Um, I'll just mention a resource that I didn't have that didn't fit into this this exercise. But Red for the World recently uh, filmed, uh, uh, created a video based on an interview with a woman in in Oregon, who is a first generation immigrant, and and it, she tells her story powerfully in this in this uh, short film, and we're expecting Congress to put out uh, an immigration bill this year. So, so we have some opportunities to weigh in and apply that racial equity lens to, to say immigration law and immigration policy. So we have a lot of good opportunities ahead of us and Brett is eager to, to develop resources and tools for people to be able to act on those things. So I, I'm trying to be hopeful but Louise, I, I hear what you're saying. It, mm -hmm. it, sometimes amidst COVID and, and being in our rooms and, and, and seeing so much going on, it's, 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 it's difficult to feel hopeful at times.